If you're a seasoned deck builder looking for a commander challenge, we've got eight build arounds that are going to give you some trouble, but be well worth the payoff. I'm Mia, and I'm sitting on two booster seats right now. I'm busy. My sleep schedule is in literal shambles. Joined by Amber, and that makes us the Nipping King Nerds, sponsored by Card Kingdom. They're the best place to go to buy cards, to buy singles, to buy doubles, anything Magic the Gathering related or pun related, you can find on Card Kingdom. They're actually pre-ordering for Modern Horizons 3 right now, so go check it out, use our link, and tell them we sent you. We're also sponsored by Dragon Shield, best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. If you use the code Nerds. at checkout, you can save 5% on your entire order. That is Sleeve Crafter sleeves that is the new dual power sleeves that is everything on that website and there is a lot to choose from absolutely and moxville.com what about it i don't know we'll figure we'll figure it out later and our patreon is a great way to see extra nipping nerds content that you cannot see on youtube we actually make more content than videos every single day we also have gameplay podcasts and exclusive behind the scenes stuff that you get first access to access to if you pay us dollars out of your wallet so we would appreciate it but we're going to go into these build rounds these are some wacky weird build rounds that i think if you're if you're running low on deck building juice and you kind of want to build a new deck but you don't really know what you want to do i think these are a really cool place to start because they're like not commanders but they're things to work towards in a given commander deck these are not cards that you can slap into every deck these are not the staples that you are used to when someone's like oh you can power up your deck by doing this you can make your deck more fun by doing this the first one is helix pinnacle one that Beezy actually ran in a deck that has since been retired it is a green for an enchantment with shroud which makes it funny if you pay x you could put x tower counters on it at the beginning of your upkeep if there are 100 or more tower counters on it you win the game this is a card that says if you pay a hundred and one mana, you win the game, but not immediately. You still have to wait <laughs> till your next turn. However, it does have Shroud, so it's safe from most removal. This is not a card that is even invincible because uh, this is one of my favorite things to destroy with Druid of Purification. Uh, that just gets around Shroud because it's pushed for some reason. But, but this card is very, very fun. Most of the time, it is not interactable. And if you want to go this wacky alternate uh, win con route, this is a really cool way to do it. I had this in my Vorinclex Monstrous Raider deck, and I think that's one of the best commanders for this card to go in, because Vorinclex says every time you pay any amount of mana to put any number of counters on it, it's doubled. So I can pay in intervals of one, just keep paying one mana to put two counters on it as many times as I want, and that means you'll have to spend 51 mana to win the game. Vorinclex is so powerful. There's a reason why it's so expensive and one of the most expensive cards from the Kaldheim set to begin with, but it's just good in general, and if you do need a wacky little win con that you don't want to go Planeswalkers or what Poison or whatever in your Vorinclex deck, why not Helix Pinnacle? I yeah, mean, you could 51, that's it? You could totally do like a Helix Pinnacle deck where you're trying to proliferate counters and stuff, but you never even attack or deal damage. You're just like, I'm going to proliferate a couple different enchantments that have counters on them, one of them being Helix Pinnacle. There's also Evolution Sage. Now whenever you play lands or you fetch or you ramp, you get extra counters and it sort of saves you a mana. I don't know if saves you a mana is the right way to go when you have to spend 100, but it feels like we're saving mana, so I'm going to count it as ramp. Especially when you can put things in like Astral Cornucopia, which you can proliferate the counters on that to make more mana, which you can pay into Helix Pinnacle, because if you're going to be paying mana into something, of course you want it to be Helix Pinnacle. Yeah, and then you throw Everflowing Chalice in, so now you have two rocks that can, that it like scale with the game and then always pump into. <laughs> you can almost you're... set those two rocks aside and say, this is my Helix Pinnacle mana, and the rest of my mana will be the not dying to my opponent's threats mana. You're not playing creatures for the most part, unless they proliferate Helix Pinnacle, of course. Of course, of course. We're also going to play Seedborn Muse. Seedborn Muse saw a lot of like increase in play after Prophet of Crufix got banned, and people realized, oh, I can do a similar thing. But what if we never wanted to cast a spell in the first place, and every Seedborn Muse paired with Helix Pinnacle is the perfect thing because we're going to sink all of our mana, all of our extra mana, which is quadrupled essentially into the Helix Pinnacle. So now if we have 25 mana on our turn through a Ever Everflowing Chalice or something as Amber tries to roll around on the table, we can make 100 and then untap and win. I mean, I'm not surprised you would put this in here. When I have Seedborn Muse in my elf deck, if I don't have 10 elves to tap with Lathril, I need something to do with all of those untaps. And if I have extra mana, I should probably be putting it into Helix Pinnacle, right? <laughs> no. Well, you can either play it in a Lathril deck to win the game, but I think putting it in a, in a Helix Pinnacle deck to say my entire engine and threat is on board. <laughs> Good luck. That's scary. That <laughs> it's is, scary. But if you want three times and also four times the mana, put Nyx Bloom in, Ancient in with Seedborn Muse because every single time you'll be getting 12 times the mana with every turn cycle. Right. So if I have a Vorinclex and a Nyx Bloom Ancient out and I have 
Helix Pinnacle in play, I can pay, I can tap one land to create three mana, which will put six counters on Helix Pinnacle. So every single mana you could have made will now put six counters on Helix Pinnacle, and you're that much closer to win the game. I think having a progress bar in terms of like like of a face up public progress bar to how close you are to winning is super funny. And I have built not only this deck, um, the Helix Pinnacle deck, but a different deck before that I wanted to mill myself where the deck was a visible uh, telling of how close I am to win. I think that's really interesting and it creates this dynamic in the game where people are like, we gotta take them out. Uh, I think it can only be fun, no matter how, if you wanna go mono green, which is the cards we listed, or you could mix it up and just go like five color enchantments. You could do whatever commanders you want. It's a way more fun way to have a progress bar. I know a lot of people think of like poison as like the anti-progress bar. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how close are you to losing? Cause you can't take these counters off for the most part. But instead with the, how close am I to winning? Especially since people won't be nuking it around around like 20 counters, 30 counters for the most part. So you're safe for a good long time, especially with the Shroud. Next up has been one of my favorite cards to cast, even though it is technically uncastable because it has no mana value. This is Inevitable Betrayal. It has no mana cost. You cannot cast it uh, for a mana cost. It is a sorcery. It has Suspend for one blue and blue, which means you exile it with three counters. Each turn you remove one. Then when the last one's removed, you cast it for free. And what it does is you search target opponent's library for a creature and put that card onto the battlefield under your control. Then that player shuffles. So you have to wait three whole turns to get this really cool bribery effect. Normally bribery's five mana, so they gave you a little bit of a discount. But what we're gonna do with this card, and we're gonna build our entire deck around it, we're gonna get a, a five finger discount. We're gonna get a five mana discount, because we're not gonna cast it at all for any mana. You can still cast this spell without paying its mana cost for zero. So we're gonna use things like Shardless Agent, which is a three mana two two with Cascade. And we want cards that, are, that have Cascade and low mana values. Because if I Cascade with like Apex Devastator, I'm gonna hit the first four spells that I flip off the top. But if I have no two drops or one drops in my deck and I cast Shardless Agent or Violent Outburst or Arden Plea or whatever, I always cascade into Inevitable Betrayal. And this is a built-in way to make this like your secret commander without having to tutor for it. It's just the only card that costs less than three. Also keep in mind, you also can't have any zero cost. That includes Mana Crypt and stuff. But I feel like Inevitable Bet Betrayal is one of the hallmark cards of Cascade decks because they're one of the only decks that can reasonably cast it in time. Yeah. So it's super fun. You can also put Mystical Tutor in your deck. So you can put this on top, make sure you don't Cascade into it though. And then, so when the, you get your first flip off the Cascade, you can make sure this is on top so you cast it for free. Yeah, there's so many different ways to go with Inevitable Betrayal, and I like it because it scales with your opponent's decks. You're never going to be able to really pub stomp with a deck that's only trying to cast Inevitable Betrayal, because you're getting their best creature, or whatever their best creature for the context of the situation is. I think it's really, really cool, and I've never had this card, even when I, you know, get lucky in my deck that's not fully built around it, and cast it on turn three, I'm not, I don't feel like I've cheated or the game's over. It's still a lot of push and pull that, to go. It's also, what are you going to get the best six drop? I mean, you are a few turns ahead, and that's amazing, but it's not like you're a few turns head, ahead permanently, right? It's just one creature. So I don't feel it's too bad. It's Anyways. like, I'm going to use your best thing against you. You were clearly planning on using it against me, so I think it's okay if I use it against you. And you could go a different route with this. You don't have to cascade into it. You can also cheat it out from your hand with something like Baral's Expertise, which says blah 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 about three things but you can cast a spell that costs four or less from your hand for free and this costs four or less so now you can say on top of this expertise or any of the five expertises i'm also going to cast inevitable betrayal for free take your best thing right now i love brawl's expertise i play it in yarok where we're getting a lot of etb triggers so bouncing them back to my hand and then playing again will get me double the value but playing it like this is a very creative and cool way to do it make your own luck this is also a new one from outlaws this is five mana and basically you get a card and you can also plot something and so in the end, when you plot something, it's a little bit telegraphed to have an inevitable betrayal, but you can play it for free. And that's what we're really looking for. Yeah. So you draw three plot inevitable betrayal, which will now cost zero from the plot zone, the exile zone, the plot zone, the plot zone. and it's face up. But it's also face up if you suspend it. So I feel like the intention there is kind of the same. And like, what are they going to do? I don't know. They can hold up a counter spell. They could do that anyway. I, I feel like it's really cool and you don't know who you're going to target. This is also quicker than that too because to spend three, that's a long time to do. Yeah, so spend three leaves three whole turns for three whole players to interact. This is just, I have this next turn, get ready. There are also other zero mana uh, 
suspend only cards and i think it might be cool to build an entire deck around those cards maybe you could play nothing that costs zero one or two like we mentioned before and just have that be the whole plan and say i don't even know which one of these i'm gonna hit but i think my favorite is definitely inevitable betrayal we already build so many decks and you're making me want to build another one especially since you mentioned at one point that you had a one drop only deck that's just like <laughs> that oh no fun. now i'm going to be like building this next but another cool card that i've seen you play yet again is Audric lunar marshall three and a white for a 3-3, three, three, and it can be your commander. At the beginning of each combat, creatures you control gain first strike until end of turn if a creature you control has first strike. Same is true for flying, death touch, double strike, haste, hexproof, indestructible, lifelink, menace, reach, skulk, trample, and vigilance. That is a lot of words, so we're going to need some creatures with a lot of keywords. Yeah, I don't even necessarily think that this card needs to be your commander. I'm not talking about an entire deck here. I'm talking about Odric in the 99 as a way to like spice things up, maybe have it be like plan B or it's like your lieutenant where you're looking for him every game so that you can use your other commander that cares about giving keywords plus Odric and have some kind of gigantic board state. I think the one creature I always think of because it's in every precon that's ever existed is Zatulpa Primal Dawn. It's got flying, double strike, vigilance, and trample. And that's going to give that to all of your team with Odric. I mean, 1-800-Are-You-Flapping is just keyword soup, right? And that is just perfect for this deck, especially if you do add your commander, but you don't have to. But it's mono white anyways, so whichever way you go, this will work with it. Yes, and also it's indestructible. I don't know if I mentioned indestructible. There's, so, ma keywords. There's so many keywords on it. Just give your team everything, right? Everything ever, and it gives you a free attack. It's super, super strong. Uh, we also have Samut, Voice of Descent, who has Vigilance, Haste, and Double Strike, those are all very good things for Odric to replicate to all of your creatures, and that's really sweet. Plus, if you need to untap something, you can. I mentioned this earlier, but BZ actually played this in the 99 of Oketra, and Double Strike to all of your creatures gets really nasty really quickly, especially if you have some sort of life link or something. It's just they're gaining so much life, you can't do much about it because your creatures will die, and you can't take all of that to the face either because you will die. Yeah, Oketra was an honorable for this, and I guess we're talking about her now, but she, she has Double Strike herself and makes tokens with Vigilance, so it's like the freest attack. You just send everything in with Double Strike Vigilance. It's pretty cool. It just adds up so fast. Akroma, Vision of Ixidor. Remember is, this card? I didn't, but this does have part and it has so many keywords on it and it gets counters for keywords, I think, right? It gives your team plus one, plus one for each keyword they have. Yeah, when you replicate all your keywords to all your creatures, then Okroma's like, cool, how many did you replicate? Oh, they have five things now because you have Zatalpa? Great, they all get plus five, plus five. And with that particular interaction, double strike trample means the game's over. That You don't even need double strike at that point. If everything's hitting for like 10 plus vigilance or something, that's still, I don't even need double strike. I mean, I just, trample I'm means, just, yeah, no, no chumpies. Yeah, that just means like, oh God, I'm going to die, huh? Yeah, uh, I also like Angel Fire Ignition. It's a crappy like... I don't even want to say it's a combat trick because it's a sorcery, but it gives a bunch of keywords and some counters, and normally that's makes for a good attack with one thing. But I think if somebody played Odric and then this in a Boros deck, so Odric's not your commander, obviously, I would go, sir or madam, mad respect, because now I'm dead, because it's got lifelink and all these keywords and I'm getting destroyed. This has to be your secret commander in a deck where it technically can be your commander, but it's just so versatile. No matter what keywords you want to build around, except for Skulk, don't build around Skulk. Skulk is a joke. <laughs> um, I would highly recommend it. just getting creative with it. It can be super ad advantageous for you to do. Yeah, we're going to move on to another white card, but it's not a, a commander. It's not even possible. It's Halo Fountain, two and a white for an artifact. White, tap, untap, tap creature you control, get a 1-1 one, one citizen. White, white, tap, untap, two untap creatures you control, draw a card. White, 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 tap, untap, 15 tap creatures you control, you win the game. Now that just sounded like I was saying random words and sounds there, but if you have one creature that is tapped, you get a citizen, two tapped, you draw a card, and if you somehow get 15 tapped creatures and five mana, which is not that hard as the other thing, you win the game. And now, so this could be our, our secret commander, our alternate win condition, anything we want. You could, There's a few ways you can go about this. One of the most popular ways that I've seen actually is Shurikai Genesis Engine and just the vehicles thing in general. Because you can tap your creatures into crewing stuff, you can just untap them because of that and you don't even need to swing with them to win the game if you have the five mana and the creatures to do it. Shurikai also makes creatures, plus gives you a little bit of card selection. So in the end, it just does a little bit of everything and just, it's really great for this. It's also an artifact so that's tutorable in the same way that Halo Fountain is, like with an Enlightened Tutor or something. And I think Shorkai is an extra good one because it makes creatures like you said, but then you tap all of your creatures to crew it, 
Now it's a creature, so when you tap it to make another creature, you can use the Halo Fountain to untap Shorkai and another creature if you have enough to crew it, and now you're just making more dudes and drawing cards and getting further to the, the end game, which is I win. Honestly, Shorkai is just a really good card in general in the 99. I play it in Door to Nothingness. It's, it, it's amazing. I tutor for it a lot of times if I'm early enough in the game because it's just bodies, card advantage, and just it's really beefy if you can crew it. I like the idea of like this tappy, untappy artifacts deck. You can also go a different route. And because the thing I think of most with Halo Fountain is how am I supposed to get these creatures tapped? Because if I attack with them all, they're, some of them are going to die because they're probably really weak if I have a bunch of them. But you can use like Night Air of, of Eos to convoke, tap a bunch of creatures artificially, cast the spell for free, draw a few cards off of it, and now use the Halo Fountain to untap them. Just a note though that. If you do manage to get 15 creatures on the board and you attack with them, you can untap them before the damage step so that you can win the game before they ever even die. That's why you can use things like Call the Copper Coats, which just says, okay, I am holding up seven mana, end step, make a creature for each creature you have, and you, and you, that's probably 15 because it's three people's worth of creatures. Now all you got to do is untap, survive with the halo, and as long as you tap them to attack, you can now activate the ability, untap all 15, or how many, however many there are, you untap 15 of them, and then you just win. You know there's always one deck running around that's just token city, right? They just have 10 billion creatures. You're yeah. gonna be targeting that person. This is the card if you're getting sick of like overruns and uh, Moonshaker Cavalry to end the game. This is like, Jet no, near. if I just go wide enough, don't, you don't have to do math. Math is for no one, because I just win. All I have to do is count to 15. <laughs> that is a pretty good way to look at it. Battle Screech is also a way to make creatures because it taps some of your creatures and you can make more creatures. And the tapping actually can pay into the flashback cost. I thought this was the perfect card for this deck. And it's kind of like on the fringe, people don't play this card that often, but it's four mana and you tap one other creature after you play it to get four flyers, but some of your creatures are now tapped, so that means you can activate Halo Fountain to either give you another token if you need, if you're close to 15, or draw cards to find ways to make more tokens. And I feel like these four cards interact super well together, and I'm like, ooh, Halo Fountain Artifact Crew Deck? It could definitely work. Plus, with the flyers of Battle Screech, you can chip in for a little bit of damage. And, you know, that really adds up over time, especially if you're trying to survive. Especially if you're using Moxville.com, because we're talking about little incremental value things adding up over time. All the little UI improvements Moxfield makes. Whenever somebody adds them on Twitter and they have a genuine problem, Moxfield goes, oh, yeah. We should fix that, and then they fix it. And that means that when you build decks, you know that the UI and is going to get more intuitive and better, and it's already perfect, and it can never get better, and it's the best way to build decks. We love Moxfield. Honestly, if you come and ask us questions on our decks, we have the ability to respond to you, too. It's one of the only ways to directly contact us in, like, a weird way. That's true. But Go, go follow us, too. Go follow us. We are the most followed account that is not Moxfield created, so... We would love you forever. Yeah, help us help us keep the title. <laughs> keep the title. Kings of Moxfield. The King and Queen of Moxfield. That's <laughs> what I want to be known. That's what I want on my gravestone. <laughs> but if you go into our Moxfield, one of the cards that you're going to see in one of my decks and one of Beezy's is Quest for Renewal. One in a green for an enchantment. Whenever a creature you control becomes tapped, you put a quest counter on it. If there's four or more quest counters on it, untap all creatures you control during each other player's untap step. This is in my lateral Blade of the Elves deck because it means that every single turn, if I can get to those four counters and I have 10 elves, I can trigger lateral every single time and have everyone lose 10 and I gain 10. And in one turn cycle around, that means death for the entire table, there's except a, me. There's a lot going on here. This looks like, oh, you have to tap your creatures and fiddle around, but you can actually just attack with four things to get the quest counters on this. Maybe you'll lose a token or whatever. Then now all of your other creatures still gain this ability to be untapped. And it's sort of like, it's got quests in the name and you have to build up to it and it's not something you get immediately. It's really cool. It builds up into a threat and then it still cares about what you actually have. Because if you don't have any creatures in play, this doesn't do anything. So I think it's a super fun build around to like work your deck towards the, oh, all my stuff is activating abilities and maybe I'm copying things. Maybe I've got like Rings of Bright Hearth and maybe I'm tapping for mana with them. And the thing I think of first is like Crypto with Right. Now you give your creatures the static ability to just tap for mana. So you're powering out stuff and if you've got flash or activated abilities to pour mana into, now Quest for Renewal says, great, every turn you're doing something. Plus, Cryptolith Rite is a guaranteed way to get the four counters immediately. Cryptolith Rite also comes down so cheaply. So you could do Quest for Renewal and Cryptolith Rite, and in the first few turns already have the four counters that you need to set yourself up for the rest of the game. I mean, our deck's going to have things like Llanowar Elves and stuff coming down on turn one. It's so green. we're going to be able to set up pretty quick. Basically, every green deck has all of the little mana dorks mm -hmm. that you're needing to get ahead of everybody else. So you're going 
going to be able to get those super fast. I have this in my Svela Ice Shaper deck, and it's one of the most fun cards. That deck's a budget deck, and I kind of break the bank a little bit for this 5 or $6 enchantment. I love even just the interaction with Svela itself. So if you have a Secret Commander Quest for Renewal deck, throw Svela in there. She taps to make Icy Manoliths, and as she gets untapped every turn by the quest, the ability gets more and more free, and you can make more and more until eventually, now you can pump multiple activations of the last ability, which is like, go cast a spell for free. It's completely <laughs> nuts, and it makes this really dangerous. This is going to be one of those types of enchantments where you don't need target removal in the beginning because it's like, okay, maybe you have a little bit extra mana, but in the mid to late game, if they're ramping out stuff way faster than you, you're going to have to kill it. I also mentioned that this is my Lathril deck, because, and that's another place where you're going to have to kill this super fast. BZ can attest to that, though. Yeah, I mean, if you have Lathril and 9 Elves, or 10 Elves, then by itself, that's 40 damage in a turn cycle. So 40 life to me also. You can't let that go. You just you just <laughs> lose the game. That's that's like a more, I think, uh, powerful way to play it. I like doing the building up to silly abilities where I have to put a lot of work in and there's no question that it's a lot of trouble to go through to get this done. But once you're there, the table has to respect you as a threat and you will win the game. Kamal Pit Fighter is one of those ways. It's six mana and you can bolt someone when you tap them, but you can bolt someone every single turn. So it's like, okay, you, then you, then you. Kamal and is awesome. <laughs> it'll start adding up after a while if you could do it on every player's turn. I really like it. He's a six, one for six with haste. And he just, you can also bolt creatures. So what I do is I just hold him up and I say, if you leave me alone, I won't bolt your thing. And then when I, it's about to be my turn, I tap him to bolt the best thing that I haven't agreed not to touch. And when you can take the driver's seat, untap him, copy the ability, whatever, whatever, just burn away all the opponent's creatures and eventually their life totals as a pseudo win con. Six mana is just so much for this, though. This, so is a, cool. this is definitely a janky way to play it, but it's a fun way to play it. Tap lightning bolt is cool. I'm sorry. Next, we're going to go to the card that is easily the worst magic card on this list. It's the hardest to pull off. That means it's going to feel the best when you actually get it going. It's Skullstorm. Seven black black sorcery. When you cast this spell, copy it for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. That already makes me sound like, oh, that's a cool line of text. You know, we can make that happen. We can get going. What's the text? Each opponent sacrifices a creature. Each opponent who can't loses half their life rounded up. Oh my god, this card is so bad. This card is so bad that it's like challenging me to make it not horrible. Even if you get two version, like two copies of the spells, so like two total copies, that sounds great, but like their opponent sacrifices their only creature and then only loses half their life and you spent nine mana plus setup of getting your commander out. Oh my god, it's so bad. So like how can we make this into an actual scary win con? My first thought is really cheap commanders. And I say commanders plural. Why would I, you know, like you could play Ashnod Flesh Mechanist, but she's only one commander. You can only ever cast her for one, then three, then five, and the tax gets too much. But having two commanders like Warnog and Bjorna means that they, they now cost two, two, four, four, high amber, six, six, and you can maybe get them out more of more often and get more copies of Skullstorm. BZ has these commanders in a deck and he doesn't have Skullstorm in them, but they come out so fast that it's easy to see why these would be the best commanders or at least really great commanders for this pairing. Skullstorm is one of those cards where it's like, I love my, I love a good big chunky sorcery that does a lot of stuff if done right. But this one is just so tough to pull off because it's like, okay, if they can flash in one creature or even a couple tokens, it's like, okay, cool. Um, I guess you can not lose half your life at least once. It's so bad between they sack a creature and they lose half their life. I'd so much rather them have lose half their life. So I think a reasonable expectation for Skullstorm, I didn't mention this, is I would be pretty happy if I got three or four copies. So that kind of means that I want two commanders, like I said, but also means that like a five mana commander is sort of out of the question for this. Whatever my real commander is, if this is my secret commander, I probably prefer Wernog Bjorna or Ashnod Flesh Mechanist or something that costs one that I can at least cast three times or with Wernog Bjorna four times and then get five copies of Skullstorm to just end people's lives. Because it's like, well now, maybe you have two creatures, that's a reasonable assumption. They're gone, and you go from 40 to 20 to 10 to five. And now I have to find some way to finish you off, but that's a good starting point. I also think Tassiger the Golden Fang is a nice option because we can start sacrificing him and replaying him, but the delve and commander tax overlap, so I can pay extra cards out of my graveyard instead of paying more mana for him. So if I mill my whole deck, 
I can cast him like five or six times and then get that skull storm going. This is just off topic, but have you ever considered maybe throwing this into like Carador number eight? Because you cast him a lot. I, Carador is another one you can always cast for three. With a sack outlet, that could be the way to go. Maybe you can make some mana off of it. I think that's that's definitely one way to go with Skullstorm. It gets the engines turning. Gets the gears turning in my head for how to build this. <laughs> in a Carador deck, of course, right? In any deck. But Carador, <laughs> of course, you know, I build those I build those decks every once in a while. As we mentioned earlier, make your own luck is a great way to cast things that are hard to cast, especially something with nine mana in its casting cost. The only problem is that you do have the setup of casting your commander a few times, but this can make it earlier, especially if you can sacrifice your commander to make mana or cast it for a cheaper way. Yeah, half of this combo that we're trying to execute is cast our commander a bunch, and that costs a lot of mana. And also spending nine mana on top of that is a lot. So I think make your own luck helps draw you more cards, gets you more ramp and stuff, and then it means that you don't have to worry about the headache of actually casting Skullstorm on an important turn. Maybe you fire off a bunch of Sack Outlets and Tassiger, or maybe you want to cast Warnog and Bjorna in the same turn. Now you won't have mana left over to play some crappy 9-mana sorcery, but now that it's free on a later turn of your choice, it lets you set up and control this a lot more. So I'm kind of leaning towards this, like, Tassiger Saltai brew that we've got going? Yeah, especially since you can't play Make Your Own Luck in Wernog Bjorna because there's no green in their color identities. If you manage to get into your graveyard, though, with something like Mill or Self Mill, there's Monomic Deluge, which you could pay nine, which you were going to pay anyways, but you copy it three times. And if you cast your commander a bunch of times, those are going to copy additional times. That will actually make it so that if they have a few creatures, you can get around that and still make them lose half their life a bunch. Yeah, this is actually the way to turn Skullstorm into a W and you don't have to worry about much else because it'll be so many copies of Skullstorm that it's pretty comical. Let's say I have three commanders cast, so Skullstorm will copy itself three times. Now, when I if I were to cast Skullstorm for nine mana, I would get four total Skullstorms, which is pretty good. But if I just discard it or mill it and then cast Memnotic Deluge on it, I exile it, copy it three times, and I cast the copies, which means each casting of Skullstorm triggers to make three copies of Skullstorm, which is now 12 skull storms you're losing half your life 12 times and it almost doesn't even matter what you start at you're basically dead that is a lot of math but it definitely is worth it half your life 12 times you can't be starting with that much life even if you're at like a hundred plus it's going to be chunked down really quickly i was trying to think because even at a thousand you go 500 250 125 70 something and then the year from there just make sure that they don't have creatures though if they have 12 creatures you're going to be very sad at the that's, end I, that's how good this is is having 12 creatures is not even impossible in Commander. So copying Skullstorm 12 times might not even win you the game. And nobody can be mad now <laughs> that this complete jank that we've crafted. Uh, Tassiger, Mnemonic Deluge, Skullstorm deck coming to a table near you. Of course, it's the new meta. It's the new meta, of course. The next one is one that looks kind of like a group huggy card on the service, but we can make it to our advantage to make everyone else high amber lose the game. It's Hive Mind. Five and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery, each other player copies that spell, and each of those players can choose a new target for that copy. Not optional. It is not optional, so we're going to make it so that they just don't profit off it, and we are building our decks around this as our secret commander, so they can't win the game with it. One of the ways that we're going to make them lose the game is with Pact of the Titan. This is a bad card. If they don't pay four and a red on their upkeep, they're going to lose the game, and all they're going to get out of it is a bad creature. And if they aren't running red, they can't pay for it anyways. Yeah, so when we make, we can we can play Hive Mind and then for free cast this spell, and now it doesn't matter that they would have gotten a ton of advantage off of Hive Mind, because when we cast it, it's too late. The game's over. Now you get a stupid 4-4 that you don't want, and you have to pay four and a red, and if you can't, you lose the game. Some decks, especially with red, since it's the worst colored commander, are not going to possibly be able to pay red. Uh, they only have command tower and their basic lands in play. They just lose on their upkeep. It's hilarious. It's funny. It's like group sluggy. And the funniest thing is that if people can pay, it's going to get back to you and you still will have to pay for in red. So make sure that you have that mana sort of like set aside in your head for how your next turn is going to go because it's not going to kill everybody, but it's going to kill one or two players. It will. And they're only going to get this bad creature. It's like, I get a bad creature. You Ooh, get four, four. lose the game. Yeah, what the, I receive. <laughs> yeah. So in the end, that I, I feel like this is going to be the worst pack to put in your deck, but it's going to be the best because people won't be able to put, pay it the most. Yeah, one of the other funniest ones is Enduring Ideal. This is a spell with Epic, which is only on five cards ever. And Epic says for the rest of the game, you can't cast spells. 
But with Enduring Ideal, you get to search your deck for an enchantment, put it into play every single turn. And so, like, you get to copy it every time. So all we gotta do is cast Hive Mind and then Enduring Ideal. Now nobody else can cast spells for the rest of the game, and we get to use the rest of our enchantments that we put in our deck for this exact reason to now win, and other people are gonna go, uh, I don't know, Ristic Study? <laughs> like, and it's not gonna help them. We're gonna, we're gonna absolutely destroy them. From this point, we can basically just say, hey, I'm going to flip most of my deck up. You guys don't have enough enchantments to beat me. Let's just call it here. See, this is Secret Commander in like two parts. You need Hive Mind and then you need to like dive into a win con for the most part. Because in the end, you can't put, I wouldn't put like Pack of the Titan and Enduring Ideal in the Hive Mind deck because I feel like they need specific builds for each other. You want to pick a couple. You can pick a couple instant sorceries that are disasters for your opponents. I also like Paradigm Shift. It switches your graveyard and your library. So if you have ways to exile graveyards already running around like Soul Guide Lantern or Leyline of the Void, or you just want to free ball it and hope nobody has cards in their graveyard, now your opponents are just going to deck themselves. <laughs> That's a really funny way to do it. I just... I think Hive Mind's a really cool card to just be building around in the end because people will, or they might let it resolve because it, on its surface, kind of looks like group hug. It's like, oh, well, if you have like an opt, I get an opt. That's not too bad. That's people who've never seen Hive Mind before. If I see Hive Mind, I go, oh, God, if we don't counter it, we're going to lose. Or I have to somehow counter the the copy that I make on the stack For of Hive me. Mind or something. Yeah. And so it leads to really silly games because all of the ones we mentioned. They're kind of, the game's not over, you're, but you're put into a position where you're probably going to win. Like, okay, now two non-red players have lost. You had to spend five mana, so now I'm going to untap and get to use my hive mind more and make you cast other weird stuff that you have no control of. Or, like, we're going to flip enchantments, guys. Can your enchantments beat my enchantments? <laughs> probably not. But then I also like Paradigm Shift, where the game's not over, but it's like, hey, player A has three cards left, player B has two, player C has ten. What are we going to do? And, and me, maybe me as the hive mind uh, player... I've only got seven or something. Yeah, it's just, it makes games very, like, spicy. There's also Earthquake. It's going to deal X to each player and non-flyers, but you're going to copy that so many times that there's going to be so much damage spread around the table. This is really funny because it can lead to draws if everybody dies to the same Earthquake copy, but it also leads to you doing math because you need to figure out is there a number of earthquakes I can cast for X that leave me alive and everybody else dead? And sometimes, yes. The answer is yes. If you're at, like, 29 and everybody else is at 28, you can start firing them off for 7 or something. And then the last one resolving kills everybody but you, and it's super good and you feel like a genius. You know, if you ever see me pull out a calculator at the table, you know what I'm doing. I'm doing, my, I'm doing my earthquake math in the coroner. This next card is a Mia Largo favorite. I'm just going to read it and then throw it over to her because she loves it so much. And it is really cool. It's Radiant Performer. Three red red for a 2-2 two -two flash when it enters the battlefield. If you cast it from your hand, choose target spell or ability that targets only a single permanent or player. Copy that spell or ability for each other permanent or player it could target. Now, each thing targets a different one of those things. Thoughts? This is such a cool card. I know it's based off Radiate, but... With Radiant Performer, it's like a body, which if you can, you can bounce it back. If you, It doesn't win immediately, and then you can keep playing it to copy all these abilities. Five mana is a lot to put into it, but if it's a, a an ability that you can't copy or a spell that you can't copy elsewhere, that's fine because it might win you the game. Like with Door to Nothingness, that just says basically 10 mana target player loses the game. Double Wubrig is hard to get, but if you target yourself with it and then you play Radiant Performer, it'll copy it for everybody else and you will win with you lose the game on the stack. Just watch out though because if the Radiant Performer gets countered, you will lose and it yeah. will be rough. You still have you lose the game on the stack <laughs> targeting you. That you know that would be unfortunate, but what a way to go. I, like, I will point, be happy with point that. Point the, the weapon at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'll do this yeah. one, guys. I'll kick things off, everybody. Yeah, I think this is super cool. Like, having 15 mana is kind of a joke. It's so hard. But you do have Ramos as that commander, so I think it's pretty possible. And it has happened before. And it's just, what a what a power move. But you don't have to play Door to Nothingness. These rest of the cards have nothing to do with Door to Nothingness. You could actually just use a Radiant Performer as an I win the game right now button with something like Assassin's Trophy. Assassin's Trophy destroys target permanent and opponent controls. And they search for a basic and put it into play. Notably, this says an opponent controls. So 
None of your permanents can be targeted, so they won't be. It radiates to everything you don't control, including all their lands, and the only thing they're left with is the number of basics left in their deck, which is probably not high if they're not playing mono color. It's not going to be high enough for the Assassin's Trophy Radiant Performer one. I, my friend used this as a win con once, once the door got egged game over. It's so good. It's just so immediate, and seven mana for a win con is not unheard of. Yeah, it's like, okay, now that I've compared, like combined these two cards together, you guys have six lands maximum probably less, maybe zero, and now I'm going to win the game because my board is untouched. Like, I, I will scoop to that all day. I mean, it's cheaper than Skullstorm, right? It is. It is cheaper <laughs> than Skullstorm. Uh, we also have Zira, the Golden Sting, who attacks to put egg counters on something, and then when something with an egg counter dies, you get a card and a, and a tr creature. This is like, radiate it to all of your things. Everything is eggs. Everything is insects. Dies into a bajillion, million cards. So board wipes, even if you have one, you're going to get a full fist of cards and a whole board out of it, too. It's super sweet. I also like Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker. Not to copy the Radiant Performer. You cannot do that. It doesn't work. But to copy the Kiki Jiki target to, instead of making one copy of all your Don Legendaries, make a copy of all of your Don Legendaries, gigantic haste army, and kill somebody with it. That's going to be so much damage. Kiki Jiki is powerful to begin with, but if you can copy everything you have, that's going to get out of hand so quickly. It seriously is. So let us know what your favorite build around in this list is. If you're making any new decks with it, I definitely want to see them on Moxfield. Link in the description. And if you want to see more nitpicking nerd stuff, there's a budget video of commanders you should build if you're a budget player.